Uh, we're going to be starting today in Romans chapter 10. So if you have your Bibles, if you have your smartphone, your smart device, just turn on your Bible and, and we're going we're gonna to start in Romans 10. Let's pray and then, uh, and then we'll begin. Father, thank you for your goodness and grace here in these moments we have together. Father, we pray that you would open our eyes to see, open our ears to hear, open our minds to understand. We make room for you. Would you speak to us now? Reveal yourself and all that you want for us. In the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word. Amen. A six-year-old girl was drawing a picture one day, and her teacher said, what are you drawing? And the little girl answered, I'm drawing a picture of God. The teacher was surprised and um, said, but nobody knows what God looks like. <laughs> the little girl carried on continuing to draw and replied, <laughs> they will in a few minutes. It's kind of how I feel about uh, the book of Romans and the Apostle Paul and this letter that he's writing. We're in the middle of this series, and before Easter, we made it through chapter 7, and, and we called the first half life in the balance. A lot of tension, a lot of covering issues of justice and mercy, and, 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 but now we're in the second half of the book, and, and and what's happening is we're starting to see God be displayed in the writings of the Apostle Paul. We're starting to we see the, a picture of him developing in these writings. And uh, so, so the second half of the letter, we're going to call it Life in the Spirit. It is the, the work of God's Spirit in us and the work of Christ that we're acknowledging here. And so over the next few weeks, we're going we're gonna to go through the rest of of Romans. Now, big picture, you can see the book of Romans. It's in your message notes, actually, there. I've written it out for you. It can actually be divided into five sections, right? The first section is chapter one through the middle of chapter three. It's all about the devastating effects of sin. And, and Paul the Apostle talks about what sin is and what's the impact of sin and why, why did Jesus even need to come in the first place. The second section is the middle of chapter three to chapter five, and it's all about salvation. It's all about what God has done, his answer to our sin problem and the struggle, how we can be rescued and how we can receive from him and be saved. His third section is chapter 6 through chapter 8. It's all about <laughs> sanctification. Sanctification is a good theological word. It's a good Christian word. And it means that God is working in us his will and his purpose and his life. And, and what happens is God's spirit comes to dwell in us and then he begins to work his way and his life out into our lives. And so that's what happens after you are born again and, and become a follower of Jesus. The fourth section is chapter 9 through 11, through chapter 11, and it's all about the sovereignty of God. Another kind of theological word, but the sovereignty of God is really about God being in charge. And the difficulty of understanding that God is really in charge with all the terrible things and all the confusing things that, ha that can happen and his calling and his purpose in our lives. And, and I, I'm not a big fan of saying that God is in control. I don't say that anymore because I think it just gives the wrong the wrong sort of idea. I think God is never controlling. I think he's relational and collaborative. And, and since that's true, I, I, think it's, I think we can firmly say that God's in charge, that he certainly is in charge, and, and Romans 9 through 11 is all about how he works his way and his will and his purpose out in the affairs of men, in history. And it's fascinating, and really it focuses right in on, on Israel, but the fifth section is chapter 12 through 16, and it's all about service. And so this morning, we're leaning into chapter 9 and 10 and 11. We're starting the turn here. And these three chapters are kind of a parenthesis within the book of Romans. It's like he's rolling along here and he's talking about these ideas and these really profound subjects. Uh, he's writing, if you remember, 
this group of, this fledgling group of Christians in this cosmopolitan city of Rome. There's some Jews in this little group. There's some Gentiles. There's an eclectic group of people that are starting to gather. And Paul is writing this letter to them, trying to help them discover who God really is, who Jesus is, and how his spirit works in their lives. And to do that, he begins here in this parenthetical uh, these parenthetical paragraphs, this little section, and he wants to talk about Israel's past because it's meaningful for the Jews that he's writing to. He's trying to help them understand the narrative of God, the story of God. And so in chapter 9, he talks about Israel's past and the struggle that they had in following God. And, and then chapter 10 is about Israel's present like what they're cur- what's currently going on in the nation of Israel, what God's purpose and plan and how he brought Jesus into the plan, and, and it's about Israel's in the present. And then chapter 11 is really about Israel's future. And he's talking about this contextually for all of the people gathered who would have read this letter to understand how God is working, big picture. And I want us to look at these verses today that we're going to look at, not so much for what they tell us about um, Israel, all right, or, or God's work in this nation, but I want us to look at these verses for what they tell us about the nature of God. Everybody say the nature of God. Because in Romans chapter 9, by looking at Israel's past, we're able to learn a lot about God's role And how he works in our lives. And that's really what we're going to talk about today, is God's role and how he works in our lives. And in Romans chapter 10, by looking at at Israel's present, we're able to learn a lot about our role. Everybody say, our role. Our role in responding to God's work in our lives. And really, if you think about it, all through the Bible, throughout the Bible, you can break out the verses that you read into these two kind of distinctive roles, God's role and our role. God's role and our role. And, t- and today, we're going to focus on right down in on Romans 10, 9 and 10, and that's kind of where we're going to start. But uh, we, we're going we're to kind of com- contrast and compare. We're gonna really going gonna to spend a little time on, God, uh, on our role in responding to God, what our responsibilities are in participating with the work of God in our lives. And it's worth noting that this story that we're unpacking here and the story that Paul's telling is God's story. The Bible, after all, is just a, it is a collection of stories that paint a big story about God's interaction with humanity. And... Um, it's, uh, it's important to understand that it's his story and not your story. It's not really the story necessarily of humanity. It's, and it's important that you and I understand that we are supporting cast members, supporting roles at best. The story has a star and it is not you. <laughs> it has a star, it has a central character, and it's Jesus. That's the story of God. Now, With this idea in mind, let me tell you a story about the role of a lifetime. Because when I was younger, my my family, when I was a kid, I was later teen years, my family and I went to a church together. And my dad and my my stepmom and all my brothers and sisters, we all went to this church for a couple of years, right in between while we were all at home. And as we, we were part of this church, there came a moment where there was a play that they wanted to put on a theatrical production. And the theater, theatrical production was about Noah and Noah's life and kind of the looking at Noah and that story and what Jesus said about the last days, uh, that it, it will be a lot like what happened to Noah. And so we've been practicing, and, you know, we're getting together, and the family's all involved, and people are, you know, uh, stagehands, and some people are in the play, and I, I actually sang in the play. And so, so they cast, we did all these auditions, right, and, and they cast my dad, Pastor Ken. Some of you know him. He, they cast him as Noah. 
And he, and so he, he's there. He's practiced. He's got his, he's, you know, he's been at all the rehearsals, and he's, and he's, and he's getting ready, you know, for uh, this play. And it's opening night, and here we are, opening night, and and the the whole the whole building is a buzz, and people are, are like watching, and there's an expectation, and this is cool. This church hadn't done this kind of thing before, and it was and it was super fun, and everybody has this expectation, and 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 suddenly, as it gets ready to start, there's the spotlight, and my dad is standing there. They salt and peppered his hair even more than it was then kind of like it, what it is now, and it was super gray, and then he's got makeup on, and he's wearing, you know, Bible costumes, which is essentially sheets, and he, so he's got sheets on, and he's, and, and, and he's standing there, and, and, and the spotlight comes on him, and he's got this long beard, because he's Noah, and he stands there for a pregnant pause that turns into an awkward pause. It continues. It continues. <laughs> and people are like, oh, something's wrong. What's wrong? Is he a statue? <laughs> He's frozen. What is it? And finally, he says with his most booming, Noah-like voice, boldly, he says, line, please. <laughs> It's the first, it's the, it's the beginning of the play. Line, please. <laughs> it's called red light fever. Everything was fine until the lights came on. <laughs> here's, here's the point of, in fact, my family is so funny. We, we, this is a story we tell like every Christmas. It's just so fun to tell. And, and, and we'll be around dinner and somebody doesn't know what to say and somebody will say, line, please. And it's just like, it's just like such a fun family story to tell. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> and so, um, and so uh, they gave him the line and we went on with the play. But here's, here's the point. There's nothing quite so intimidating as not knowing what your line is. <laughs> there's, there's nothing quite so terrible as not understanding what your part is. Not understanding what your role is. Feeling like you're lost in the glare of life as it's coming to you and coming at you. And, a, and as you take your place in life, just knowing what your role is is so significant, and I think that's what the Apostle Paul is saying right here. Because last week, as you recall, we talked about the, the seeds of the gospel, that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It's all God's mercy. It's all His grace. But there is a response and a role that we begin to have. And so I want us to look at Romans 10, 9 and 10, and it says this, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you, con that, that you confess and are saved. We're landing here in the middle of chapter 10 because this is a, the pivot verse upon which the argument that comes before and after depends and we land here because it is one of the most significant verses in all of the Bible that describes how we become a Jesus follower, how we invite him into our life. But I want you to notice the word if. Two little letters, the word if, verse 9, it says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, rescued. God's work in our life is contingent upon something that we must do. And one of the most important things you and I can do as we read our Bible is to discover what God's role is and what our role is. Because you can't do God's role and He can't do your role. There's something here. And some of you who went to Sunday school and some of you who have known this verse for a long time have already started checking out of this message. And I want to encourage you to lean in because 
I think sometimes, as I've said, it's not new things we need to learn. It's we need to remember and apply the ancient truths within our soul. And we can't treat this verse as if it is something that's passe. There's something we've got to identify in them. And, I, and, and so, so Paul says there's two things that to define our role and we respond to God. Notice that it's not join the church and tithe. How I wish that were the case. But that is not what he says. He doesn't say wear certain clothes and don't swear. <laughs> That's not what he's saying. It's not about generally promising God that you'll never sin again. This, this, th 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 those don't have anything to do with the roles that God wants you to assume and to take on. God's work in our life is contingent upon the two things that we must do. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth, believe in your heart. Let's read it one more time. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. See, friends, our part consists of two things, not just one. Both of these are extremely important. Confessing with your mouth and believing in your heart. You have to have both. He puts them together. And this means get confessing without believing is not enough. A lot of people say, sure, I'm a Christian, and I believe in God, I, I believe in Jesus, and, and, it's, and it's great. But here's the thing, you're only halfway there. You're only half right, because not only do you need to confess with your mouth, you, you and I have to believe in our hearts, or else you'll, you'll become like the people in Titus 1.16, where he writes, they claim to know God, but by their actions they deny him. See, one chapel, just to confess is insufficient. You've got to believe way down deep on the inside. If you look at the complete narrative of the Bible, you'll see that God is always interested in people's hearts. All through the Old Testament, even where people just, they, you, we see story after story after story where people could not commit themselves to what God had asked of them, but you see he's longing not just for good actions. He's longing for their hearts. One example of this is Jeremiah 31, 33. And the prophet is describing that this is the covenant I'll make with the people of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. He want, he's always wanted to put his law, not just as a, a form of obedience, but something that is in our hearts, that we live with him in his way. And that we embrace him in, in, in relationship with him. Jesus echoes this when he says, Luke 6, in Luke 6, 45, Jesus says, A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. Isn't that interesting? Jesus saying, way down here is where everything matters. But then there's something that comes up, and there's a connection between here and here. <laughs> there is a massive connection between heart and and speech. And you see this. And Jesus says it right here. He says at the end of this verse, he says, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. What's down here finally comes out. And when you, when you see it, what, and, and you know this just generally, this isn't necessarily a biblical thing. It's a human thing. God wired us up this way. But this is where the, the conflict begins. This is how we define lies and truth, right? You know something's true here, but you say the opposite. There's, there's, there's something about how this happens that has an impact on your life, on your thinking, on the way you function. It, it is the very definition, in a way, of integrity, right, or wholeness, as we think about what's going on here and what comes out here. Now, the word believe in the Greek means to trust in. Now, look at, look at that in your message notes. To trust in, to cling to, to rely on, to commit to. Let me ask you a question. Does that describe your relationship with God? Because look what James says in, in 
chapter 2, 19, he says, you believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. I think this is such a funny little phrase that James says here. James is saying, look, the devil and his demons believe in God. And they even tremble. But you're not going to find Satan and his demons hanging out with God in heaven. And you're not, because they're, they're not devoted to Jesus and his mission, they have a different mission. And Satan himself certainly hasn't committed himself to Jesus. A lot of people, they have head knowledge about this kind of thing, but they don't have heart knowledge. Right? What, what James is saying, it's not enough to sort of believe something in general, there, there has to be something deeper, and it's not head knowledge, it's not just understanding theology, there's something that has to do with faith and trust and commitment. Think about it this way. I believe, I can believe in money, <laughs> and it doesn't make me rich, I can believe in love, but that won't make me married. I can believe in vegetables, and they won't make me skinny. Just because, just because I believe in the vegetables doesn't mean that that can make me skinny. I know. I've tried it. <laughs> A lot of you have tried it, too. We all know we're all pervasively sold this idea. Man, our food source is horrible in America. You've got to eat good stuff. You can't eat stuff out of a box. You've got to eat your vegetables. You've got to eat the real thing. We know it. We believe it. And yet, Burger King calls. <laughs> the same thing is true with me and God. If I, I can believe in Jesus, but that doesn't make me a Christian. It doesn't make you a Christian any more than um, standing in a garage makes you a car. <laughs> Just because you come to church doesn't mean that you're a Christian. Because the key here is a, a really funny little word. It's a meaningful word. It's commitment. What or whom have you committed yourself to? So when it comes to our role, the question becomes, what do you believe? What do you trust in? What do you cling to? What do you rely on? What do you commit to? So many people will say, sure, I believe in Jesus. I believe that he died on the cross. I want you to notice. Notice what Paul is saying in Romans 10, verse 9. He actually doesn't say that dying on the cross is what we should believe. Read it again. It says, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Now, why would this be a distingu distinguishing idea? It doesn't say to believe that Jesus died on the cross. It says to believe that God raised him from the dead. This is why resurrection is the central issue within Christianity. There is something that happened there that we've got to identify with and we've got to understand. If Jesus is alive, that means there's a relationship. If he just did something a long time ago and it was nice and it's historical... That doesn't mean we can have a relationship with him. See, see, if Jesus is alive and he's active by his spirit in the earth, by the Holy Spirit, if he lives in you, if you speak to him, you pray and he speaks to you, there's a, there is a, a reality that comes from resurrection belief. And that's deeper than just understanding that Jesus went to a cross. Here's how Paul said it in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, but if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no re resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. Wow. Wow. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Wow. Apostle Paul says if there is no resurrection, everything we're doing here is pointless. 
Now, before you get too worried <laughs> about me and evangelical Christianity, let me point out that a lot of people died on a cross. It was the way a lot of people died and were punished. A lot of people died on a cross. It was a way of killing in the days of Rome. But Jesus didn't just die on a cross. He died for a specific purpose on that cross. That cross represents this pain that we live in in this world, the suffering of the world. It represents this death, this torment that is part of our world that we live in. And he came to experience it, to send you and me a message. But the message he came to send was punctuated three days later when he rose from the dead. The church calendar revolves around this Resurrection Sunday. We just had it two weeks ago. It is a meaningful and important idea that is at the root of believing in who Jesus really is. I love this quote from the brilliant theologian and author Tim Keller in this landmark book, A Reason for God. And he says this, if Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all he said. If he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about any of what he said? <laughs> right? Which totally makes sense. Why do we even consider what he said? I mean, the issue on which everything hangs, Keller says, is not whether or not you like his teaching, but whether or not he rose from the dead. And so the bottom line here is if you deny the resurrection, you're not actually a true follower of Jesus. We can't just think that Jesus had some nice teachings. And I, and I, like, I like some of the things he did and said. And so I, I, that's, that's the way I embrace Jesus. I, I embrace his, his morality. I like, how he, I like how he didn't throw stones at the woman caught in adultery. That, that's nice to me. I, I like that. It, that's not sufficient. You may, like, you, may, you may like that, but that will only lead to moralism. Some kind of moralism that you're trying to impose on yourself and in, on others, when in reality what God has in mind is a transformation from the inside out. And so, so believing has a unique way of taking hold of, of what's inside of us. Our role is to believe in, to trust in, to cling to, to rely on, to commit to Jesus and the fact that God raised him from the dead. And then believing, you know, if you, if you think about this, what Paul is saying here in this passage, believing actually isn't enough. We also have to confess. There's a confession. To believe without confession is a problem because there are no secret agents in Christianity. <laughs> There are no secret disciples. You can't hide your faith. Your faith it, it is, a, it is a thing in our culture where tolerance is the highest value. And, and, in, and in many ways, we should embrace this idea. God is so tolerant of us, of all people. We should embrace this. But, but there is no way for us to differentiate as Christians what we believe as it begins to be lived out in our life. I submit to you that God wants love to pour out. He wants forgiveness and mercy to pour out. He wants, he wants what we believe to begin to pour out and, and serve and help our fellow man and fellow sister. But that's what he wants. And that requires something deep in our soul but then there's this confession thing. What are we to confess? Paul says we're to confess with our mouths. Notice this. Jesus is, what does it say? Do you see it? Jesus is Lord. Notice he doesn't say we're to confess we go to church. Notice he doesn't say you're supposed to confess that you're a Christian or a Catholic or a Lutheran or a Methodist, as good as those things are. He doesn't even say that we're to confess with our mouths that Jesus is Savior which he is. He says there's something about confessing with our mouths that Jesus is Lord. Amen. The word Lord is used around 640 times in the New Testament. It's the single most used word for Jesus in the New Testament. And when you say Jesus is Lord, what you're really saying is Jesus is God. God. 
Lord is this word used all through the Bible. In the Septuagint, which is the, uh, one certain early translation, it's Yahweh, and this is the name for Lord. They were applying it. The writers of the New Testament were applying it to Jesus, saying, look, this Jesus he, that rose from the dead, he was God's son. There was divinity in him. He is God. Here's how C.S. Lewis the great apologist and author, he said it this way, and I'm going to read a, a big section, and you can read with me. I think it's in your message notes there, but, but I'm going to read a, a little section before and after it. Here's what he said. He said, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that, Je that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. C.S. Lewis says, a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. C.S. Lewis continues, he says, you can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about this being him, his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. C.S. Lewis, when you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you're saying that Jesus wasn't just a good man, but there was something, he was actually God. And see, friends, God actually expects us to verbalize our faith. He expects our faith to be public. And that's, that's what water baptism is that we're going to do here this evening. This afternoon at 5 o'clock, water baptism is, is this moment where you go public with your faith. It is a, com a, a public confession of your faith it's saying to your community and to the world, I'm not ashamed of Jesus. This world is not my home. I belong to him. And you're identifying, and you think of it, you're identifying with his death, his burial. You go into the water and you can't breathe. It's a symbol. But it's more than a symbol. There's a supernatural component to it. You're, you're obeying what Jesus himself did, and you're going in under the water in a community of, of friends, and then you're being raised up out of the water in a new life, and you're identifying with Christ's resurrection power that now lives in you, and you're saying goodbye to your old way of life, and you're reaching towards the new way that God is living and working in you. I was reading just this, this week when I was preparing for this about baptisms in closed countries, in countries where Christians are persecuted. And I read one particular story from a ministry that you and I support every month with your tithes and offerings. And he was telling a story about a man in North Korea that went out with a few of his friends under cover of night because if his family found out or if the government found out, he would be thrown in prison and in jail, but they went with their, 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 their friends here, and they, and they went to this little hole in the ice during the winter. Think of that. I've baptized a lot of people, and occasionally it's cold. It's never been that cold. <laughs> they baptized this believer, and their commitment to it. Now, this is what I want you to get. The commitment to it because as I'm talking about faith being public, there's a risk. There's a risk for him. There's an inherent risk in that declaration of baptism. And those people that were with him sharing that community, that moment, that commitment, and saying, I'm willing to take the risk. I'm going to be baptized. It's not, it's not common in many of those countries, to have a big celebration like we will today. Today is awesome. It'll be so fun. But we can't lose sight of what kind of commitment it is to take this step of faith, to believe that Jesus did rise from the dead. And we believe it so much we're willing to em embrace a, 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 a sacred act that has meaning and purpose in our lives with our community and, and identify with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. You see, it's like, it's, it's like my marriage to Amy. 
I said two little words about 25 years ago, and they changed my life. I said, I do, to Amy. And I hadn't, now, let's be honest, I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, I was a young man. I didn't know what would come. I didn't know what the challenges would be, but I said I do, and, and, and I began to work out, and I'll continue to work out what it actually means in my life until I die because I said I have this commitment to you. And so it begins to work its way out, and that's the way it is with becoming a Christian. When I got married, I got a ring. She bought me a ring, and the ring was an external sign she was like, he belongs to me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you can't have any of that. He's mine. And I wear it. I wear it proudly. I wear it because I want to belong to her. Because I love her. Water baptism is this similar experience where it's a public declaration. It's a symbol. It is, it, is, it is a supernatural, sacred act that has repercussions. It's not about salvation. We're, all these people that we're baptizing, they're already in Christ because believing and confessing is what it's all about. G G <laughs> Ephesians says that it's not about works. It's not about anything you can do all we're doing is responding to Jesus himself. And so this, this act is kind of our role. This thing we're going to do, it is, it is something that is an external sign of an inward reality, of an inward commitment. And so <clears throat> just like my wedding ring, and I want to pause here and just say, if you haven't been water baptized, if you, were, if you maybe were baptized as a child but it didn't mean anything for you, if you were baptized as an infant, which is something that is not of your own will, it is, it is not about your faith, it's about the faith of your parents. And, and so I believe Jesus teaches that baptism is about exerting your will. That's why we do baby dedications and water baptisms once people can choose Jesus. And so I want you to encourage you to be baptized tonight. And here's what I'll tell you. You can, just, you can take out your smartphone right now and you can sign up for it if you want to. You just text one chapel to 313131. One chapel to 313131. If you're thinking about being baptized and you're like, oh, should I do this? And you can usually feel it. It's like, oh, God's asking me to take another step. Should I take another step? The answer is yes. You can go to onechapel.com and, and it'll give you all the info. You just show up here at 4 o'clock and, and we'll walk you through that. But here, back in Romans Chapter 10, verse 9, the Apostle Paul is showing us our role. He says, confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. Here's the problem. It's easy to get our role and God's role confused. It's easy to get God's role and our role all jumbled together sometimes. And then we try to take over what God's supposed to do. And we think then he's supposed to do things th for us and that, that we're supposed to do, and we end up with some kind of, when we do that, when it all gets jumbled up, we end up with some sort of religious counterfeit. Paul called it, when he wrote to Timothy, he called it having a form of godliness but denying its power. It was a form of godliness. This is exactly what was happening to the Jewish people because the Jewish people <clears throat> had an appearance of godliness. They understood the rules. They understood what they were doing. They talked the talk. They looked religious, but they had mixed up their part and God's part. They'd mixed up God's role and their role. God was doing something new in Jesus, and they were completely missing what God was doing. If you go to, go to the first verse in chapter 10, just, just go up a little bit. In chapter 1, is, Paul says, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge, since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to be established and to establish their own. They did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the end of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. You see, they mixed up their role and God's role. Here's what happened. Number one, they, they didn't listen to him. They didn't listen to what God told them. 
Look, it says, I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. And throughout the Old Testament, you can see that the Jews were trying to do this. They, they, were, they were trying to be God's people. They're trying to be committed, but they could not. In fact, many, many times they refused to listen to God. And they went off on their own way time and time again. You know, for some people, for so some people, religion is part of their life, and they have some zeal. For the Jew of this time, they would have been reading this letter, and they understood that their whole life revolved around their religion. It, was, it consumed them. It was the centerpiece of their life. And they were zealous for God, but they missed it. They didn't listen to him. Several years ago, I, I remember seeing on, this t on, on TV this uh, advertisement about a little girl um, uh, that, that was had a liver problem. It wasn't an advertisement, but it was a story about this girl. And she, she need, had a, a liver problem. And the next day, loads of people called in and wanted to donate one of their livers. <laughs> That's what I call be, having zeal without knowledge. You know why? Because you only have one liver. You don't have an extra one to give away. And people didn't know that. And they were like, can I give her one of my livers? <laughs> this can happen to us. You can have a heart for God. You can have several experiences with God. Somewhere along the way, you stop doing what the scriptures teach you. And look at the danger of that. James 1, through 24 says, do not merely listen to the word and deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself, he goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. You forget what God is trying to do in your life. You get discouraged. You stop growing in your relationship with God. You subconsciously begin to think that you, you, you know everything you need to know. The pastor really isn't saying anything new that I need to hear. And so you stop going to church or you stop being involved in a small community of friends you, you, and you start to miss the point. You start to make yourself the center of the story. You stop, real, you, start real, uh, you, you stop realizing that there is a role for you to play, but you're not the one that everything revolves around. And what happens to you is what Paul calls in Ephesians 4.15, you become like infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. You can miss the point if you don't listen. The second way they mixed up God's role and their role, the Jewish people, was they tried to be righteous by good works. They tried to be righteous by good works. Verse 3 says, since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. They did not submit to his way of, of right standing with God. Christ is the end, in verse 4, of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Notice, they did not know God's righteousness, which only comes by faith. So they sought to establish, check it out, their own. Do you know people establish their own religion all over the planet today? There's a bunch of, there's, there's some other religions. There's a religion called Sabud which is a religious movement based on a spiritual experience that causes a spontaneous and ecstatic exercises. <laughs> it's weird. There's something called Jediism. Jediism. Do you know, do you know what this is? You can, you can guess. It incorporates Jedi teaching into this spiritual hodgepodge. May the force be with you. You know what I'm saying? Check this out. It's the seventh largest religion in the UK. 170,000 members. Jediism. There's a, there's a religion called Dudism. Dudism. Have you ever heard of Dudism? Dude, I, I think so. It comes from this. There's a movie called The Big Lebowski. You shouldn't watch it. It's terrible. But it's a. It's, there's this. There's this thing and. The, the nature of the, of the religion is to do as little as possible. <laughs> Dudism. Sadly, it's also the slowest growing religion. <laughs> here's, here's, an, here's an example of what we do when we, when we stop listening and we start creating our own sense of religion. We start putting this story in our own terms rather than God's. 
We have salvation by subtraction, which is where you give up all your bad habits and then you become a Christian. If you just stop doing anything that's fun, then God will like you. That's not Christianity. Salvation just becomes a list of do's and don'ts. Second is salvation by service. It's like, I just got to do more. I got to volunteer. I got to give more. That'll get me into heaven. God will be happy with me because I'm, my good things that I'm doing outweighs the bad things that I'm doing. Salvation by your own standards is a third one. Salvation, this is the kind of the, I think this is the, the way of our culture today. We kind of create our own standards. If it feels good, I do it. That's my religion. You got you to gotta live your own truth. You've heard that said, you do you. That's just creating your own standards. Nobody else's standards matter. Everybody living by their own individualized version of right and wrong. That's how this works. There was a professor one time, a college professor who said, there are absolutely no absolutes. <laughs> to which a student replied, are you absolutely sure? <laughs> it's important to understand that God has a role and we have a role. And it's the role of your life. It's confessing that Jesus is Lord. And, and believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And no matter what sin or what failure or what foolishness you come upon in your life, no matter what difficulty or challenge comes, if you will play this part, if you will embrace this role of confessing that Jesus is Lord, there's, there's, there's nothing that can keep you from God's embrace and his power, and his life flowing through your life. And there's one more thing. There's one final thing here. In verse 14 in chapter 10, it says, How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Listen to me carefully, church. The responsibility of every Christian is to share this amazing message with somebody else. See, if you're a Christian, this, it's not only a byproduct, it's also a responsibility. I think it happens naturally that there's a, a need to tell people what's going on. You want to tell them what's happened in your life. The perspective that the Apostle Paul is giving us in the chapter kind of begs the question then, well, why didn't God just, when we... When we why did he just take us on to heaven once we believe in him? <laughs> the moment you become a believer, it's just like gone. Sometimes you wish that were the case, don't you? I know I have. Two things you can't do in heaven. You can't sin. You can't witness. God didn't leave you here to sin, but he did leave you here to witness. He did leave you here to share his life. He's a collaborator. He's in relationship with us. He wants us to share that with others, what we've, what we've experienced with him. Here's, here's a couple of final points. Number one, God collaborates with people to reach people. Everybody in the room, somebody introduced you to him. Even if you read a book, somebody had to write the book. Even if you watched the TV program, somebody, somebody had to produce the program. And number two, all of us are sent. All of us are sent. The fact that you're a Christian, the fact that you follow Jesus means you're sent. I'm not talking about missionaries on cross-cultural uh, countries, even though we should send and we should go, we should all go. But they, I'm talking about being sent to your neighborhood. I'm talking about being sent to your, your gym club. You're, I'm talking about being at, at your workplace and realizing that you you got to confess that Jesus is Lord as you begin to understand how needy people are. There's 2.8 billion people on the planet who have never heard the story of Jesus. 2.8 billion. Right here in Travis C County, think about this, the number of none religious people, in other words, that, that on the forum said, I don't have a religion. We call them, they're called the nuns. <laughs> the nuns increased in the 2010 census, increased from 45% in 2000 to 53.8% in 2010. Right here in Travis County, Muslims increased 3.8% to 12%. Hindus increased 0% to 5.7%. Buddhists, 0% uh, to 7.8% of our population. The number of Christians decreased. 
from 43.3% to 40%. You and I have to realize we can't ignore this reality. We have a responsibility, a role to play. I want you to just close your eyes and I want you to just maybe bow your head. And I want you to think about when was the last time that you shared with somebody your story of what Jesus has done in your life? When was the last time you invited somebody to come with, with you to church? You know, we, at One Chapel, we want everyone to come to, to at least two times a year. Two out of 52, you ought to have the experience, the ride of inviting someone to church with you. Who's going to discover real life because of you? If you already have a real relationship with Jesus today, would you right now just ask God to put someone on your heart Someone specific who does not know Jesus. Just right here. Begin asking, God, would you give me a burden for someone, a neighbor, a friend, a relative, somebody you, that you might work with? Maybe ask God to help you reach one person for Jesus this year. You might say, God, I, I don't want this year to be a barren year. I don't want this to be an empty year. I want to reach a person for you. Somebody told you about Jesus. Somebody told me about Jesus. Maybe you're here today and you're not even sure if you're a true follower of Jesus. Maybe, maybe you believe in him, but you're not like ready to make the commitment. Well, the good news is today you can if you'll simply believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. And if you haven't done that, I want you to do that with me now. In your heart, if you'll just say, Jesus, I, I want to believe in you. I want to be committed to you. I want to trust you. I want, to, I want you to be my Lord. I want, you to ex I want to accept you as God in my life. And then you begin to take that next step of confession with your mouth. If you came here with a friend, then share that with a friend or come up here after service and share it with me. I'll be right here. And then tonight, consider taking that next step of faith and water baptism to make a public declaration. I want us to come to the Lord's table and I want us to, I want us to accept from him, to, to receive from him what he wants to provide. The bread representing the broken body for our healing. The cup representing the blood of Jesus for our forgiveness and as his grace in our lives, his life coming into our lives. Would you come here this morning and allow him to do that? Father, we allow you to lead us now, guide us. Give us a new start right here in these moments with you. In Jesus' name, amen.